A great controversy rages between good and evil, and humanity is caught in the crossfire. Satan has crafted his most cunning end-time deceptions, but his plans are doomed to fail. Get ready to anchor your minds in truth as the Bible exposes his lies and prepares us for our soon coming Savior. And now, live from the Campus Hill Church of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, we bring you this presentation of The Great Controversy, End Time Deceptions. Amen and amen. amen. We are here bringing you a message from the Lord in the Campus Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. Part of 3ABN Winter Camp Meeting continues. The blessings continue. And we just want to welcome you and hope that you have been blessed thus far. And there are more blessings coming. And during this hour, we have a message from Dr. Tim Standish. Darwin versus the Creator's Account. Also, the title is Delusions, Illusions, and Reality. I would like to read to you Dr. Tim Standish's uh, little biography because I can't remember all this. <laughs> so, Dr. Tim G. Standish earned a Ph.D. in environmental biology and public policy from George Mason University. His earlier studies included an M.S. in biology and a B.S. in zoology from Andrews University. Dr. Standish currently holds the rank of senior scientist at the Geoscience Research Center in Loma Linda, California. He also serves as adjunct professor in the Loma Linda University Earth and Biologi Biological Sciences Department and the Adventist University of Africa. His publications range from the molecular basis of cricket behavior. That's right, you heard it right. Cricket behavior to turtle conservation and the interface between science, faith, and public policy. We know that Satan is attacking God and his children from different angles, different directions, trying to bring before the people the idea that God does not exist. But today, you're going to hear exciting and wonderful things, and we know that God is real. Amen? Amen. Amen. Before uh, Dr. Standish comes before us with the message, we're going to have a song that I will tell you about in a moment. But before this, we're going to have prayer together. So I would like to encourage you to stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing upon all that are here present and those that are joining us through the, the, the uh, different methods that they can watch through ABN. Let us pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy unto us. And we thank you that we have the privilege of hearing a message that helps us understand that you are our creator. We, we ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless Dr. Standish with your Holy Spirit, that he may speak words from your throne of grace, and that it may be a blessing to those that are here with us and those that are joining us all over the world. We pray that this will draw us close to Jesus. And we ask you for a blessing upon all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We now invite Pastor John Lomakang to come forward. He will be singing the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And then the next word you will hear will be that of Dr. Tim Standish. God bless you.
there's light for a look at the Savior, and there's life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. For he's promised, just believe it and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying with his perfect salvation to tell. And look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Sometimes I tell pastors, I am only joking when I do this, that I don't want special music before I speak, because how can you match that? <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Why would we want to look at Jesus? I know my reason. There is something beautiful there for you to see. And I am a man with a terrible weakness. I like beautiful things. I live here in Southern California. And just walking over here to the Campus Hill Church, how much beautiful could it be? Blue skies, snow up on the mountains. Wow. And now, we get to have this beautiful experience together, because I want to talk with you about beautiful things. But just a word of warning, there are people who don't want you to see the beauty out there. There is an end-time deception that blinds people to beauty. Let's read about it. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, unrighteous deception, among those who perish. Now, I don't know about you, 
but I still quite like life. I don't want to perish. Life is a beautiful thing. It's a precious thing. Why are these people going to perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Truth is a beautiful thing. And yet, there are those who do not want to see it. And now come some of the most chilling words in Scripture. This is Paul. He's writing to the Thessalonians, Greek people, and he's warning them. He's saying, if you don't love the truth, if you don't value it, there is something that I'm warning you about. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Who's sending it? God. That frightens me. People who do not want truth will embrace deception. And that deception comes from God. Wow. God provides something else. He provides this strong delusion that they should believe the lie. If we love pleasure over what is true, we will be deceived and we will die. Deception can look attractive sometimes. In fact, that's what makes it so deceptive, isn't it? I mean, who's going to believe something that looks unattractive? We like things. We can be blinded by what appears to be beautiful. But we need to love truth more than anything else. I am not going to claim to be a prophet, and I am not going to claim to be the final word on what the end time deception is. But I do know what an end time deception is. The philosopher and enthusiastic Darwinist, Daniel Dennett, wrote about it, and he said this, little did I realize that in a few years I would encounter an idea, Darwin's idea. Up until this point in his book, he had been writing or talking about something he and his friends used to talk about when they were young, universal acid. Ironically, I remember talking about it with my own friends as well. The idea of a universal acid is it is something so powerful that it dissolves, it melts, it destroys everything that it comes into contact with. So you can't put universal acid into a test tube. It's not a real thing, it's just sort of an idea that sometimes young people like to talk about. It, destroy, it would destroy the glass of the test tube. And what would happen once the universal acid got out? It would dissolve everything. It would dissolve the whole world. It would dissolve the whole universe, wouldn't it? The universal acid's kind of a fun thing to talk about, as long as it's not real. But look at this. 
Now he starts talking about Darwin's idea. This is Darwin's theory of evolution. He says, Darwin's idea bearing an unmistakable likeness to universal acid. It eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview. Are you familiar with the concept of a worldview? This is how we perceive reality. God tells us in Scripture that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and that changes our whole view of humanity, not just ourselves. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but so are you. And as a consequence of that, you are valuable. You are beautiful. You are special. A revolutionized worldview. This changes our views. In the Darwinian view of things, you are literally knocked together by chance and some natural laws and things. There's no guidance, there is no plan. You are full of bad designs. You are not fearfully and wonderfully made. There might be some elegant things in there, but there's also lots of rubbish and garbage left over from this evolution that you've been through from single-celled organisms through worm-like things and reptiles and on and on. You see all of reality differently. Your worldview is changed. It is a like a universal acid. It destroys the universe in one sense and provides an illusion instead of a real universe. One in which most of the old landmarks are still recognizable, but transformed in fundamental ways. You can still recognize that somebody is a human being, But a human being is a different thing. A human being is not beautiful anymore. Several years ago, I had a beautiful experience. Something went wildly wrong in Israel. And as a consequence of that, I know this seems unlikely, I wound up in Athens with my friend Darius. It was kind of fun. I always think about the irony of being with somebody named Darius in Athens, given the history of people named Darius and the history of Athens. But anyway, there we were together, and we went out walking, and we saw off in the distance the Acropolis. Soon we found ourselves in the Agora, and it struck us, wow, this this is where Paul went and talked about truth. And in that marketplace, he met some philosophers, people who love wisdom. And they thought to themselves, maybe this guy has some wisdom to share with us. We love it, we like hearing different ideas, and they invited him up the hill to the right of the Acropolis. Sometimes we call it Mars Hill, or the Areopagus. And up there on the Areopagus, they could look to the left and see all of those temples up on the Acropolis. And it must have sparkled as they walked up that road to get there. Can you imagine having that as a teaching tool as you talk with people? There it was, and it was all new, or relatively new at the time, a lot newer than it is now. It must have been amazing as Paul 
looked over there, and I'm willing to bet you that he was gesturing and pointing towards those temples as he said these words to the philosophers, God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. Everything comes from God. We can't give Him anything back that He needs. And He has made from one blood every nation of men. Can you see how He is telling the story of creation here? Athens was a cosmopolitan city. People were coming in from all over the place. The philosophers who were there, we know that they, they weren't all just natives of Athens. They came from all over the place. Zeno of Sittim, for example, the, the father of the Stoic philosophers, came from somewhere completely different. Many of them, you hear a place name that is far away associated with them. And yet, Paul is pointing out, look at this, God made us, He made us through one man, He made us one blood doesn't matter whether you think you are Caucasian, it doesn't matter whether you think you're Asian, it doesn't matter whether you think you're a Native American or an African or anything else you want to come up with. All of these things that we think divide us, God points out, are artificial. They are not real. We are all one blood, a beautiful, beautiful thought. When you walk into a Christian church, you see exactly what I see in front of me right now, and this is true all over the world. People of different races, all together, all in harmony, all worshiping our Creator and Redeemer, all of us recognizing that we are descendants of Adam, and we are saved by the blood of the second Adam. Amen. Just to prove to you that I've been to the Acropolis, I'd like to show you an image of that. There I am. Now, when you're up there on the top, you realize that people exhibited some pretty bad decision-making up there. Somebody decided that the Parthenon would make a good storage place for explosives. And they did that during a war. And things went wrong. That's why it looks so damaged today. But when we look at it, we see some interesting things. Now, I need to give you a warning right now because I'm going to start talking about some math. Yeah? And you may, may be a little bit like those students that I've had over the years who've shown up in general biology class and expressed shock and surprise to learn that biology involves mathematics. But it does, and it's fabulous. So, don't panic, don't panic, because you don't have to be a genius mathematician. I want you to just look at the shape of the Parthenon up there. Remember, this is something that Paul was seeing as he talked about these temples made with men's hands. And I will tell you, it is beautiful even as a ruin. And what you can see very clearly in this building, but only really if you take a trip to Nashville, I know that seems improbable, doesn't it? 
But if you take a trip to Nashville, you will see that there is the Acropolis there. Sorry, the, 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 the Parthenon there. It has been reproduced. And so you can see it a little bit more clearly, and you can see that there's something interesting about those proportions. The Acropolis, uh, sorry, the, the Parthenon is a beautiful building. It's a beautiful building. Why is it beautiful? Well, there happen to be certain dimensions that are appealing to our eyes. If you draw a square starting on one side and going to the top and going to the bottom, it doesn't cover it. But then if you do another square that takes you from the top to the other side of the Acropolis, still doesn't really do anything. But then if you do another square, underneath that square at the edge going to the bottom, and then you start filling it in with another square, all of a sudden you find that the entire thing is actually defined by squares, and the space that you have left over inside is exactly the same shape as the rectangle formed around the outside. And so you can fill that one in with squares, and you get the same pattern. And you can fill in the little tiny bit of remaining space with more squares, and it actually goes on forever. It's a kind of interesting, interesting, interesting shape. If we start looking at the proportions of that shape, there is some interesting mathematics going on with it. It turns out that if we take that first, the, just the side of that first square, and we call it A, and we look at the ratio of A to the next square, which we'll call B, it turns out that it's the same as the ratio of those two sides. And the same is true as you go through all of these combinations of squares. It's kind of fun, isn't it? This is, this is not math with numbers. It's math with squares, and squares are relatively simple kinds of shapes. We call this kind of rectangle that's made up with this infinite number of squares a golden rectangle. And if we take the ratio of the two sides, we get an interesting number. And this is where things really become fun. Yeah. That number is A plus B divided by A, which happens to equal A divided by B. That's kind of weird, kind of weird. It's a strange number, and being strange, we give it a Greek letter, and that Greek letter is phi. One of the best Greek letters out there, because you can do all kinds of fun uh, puns with it. Phi am I here this morning? <laughs> Phi do I exist? Uh, they're not that good really, are they? And um, this particular number is an irrational number. That means it goes on forever. It, it's not like 1.25 or something like that and ending there. It's an irrational number. It goes on for eternity, for infinity. It's a divine number, a really special one. Oh, another really cool thing about it is that if you do one over phi, you get exactly the same number as if you did phi minus one. And it goes on forever as well. We symbolize that with lowercase phi. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize this 
but you've probably heard of another number that's kind of like this called pi, which is the tastiest number in the Greek alphabet, yeah. Um, it also goes on forever. And out there in the universe, there are all sorts of things that involve pi. It turns out that there are all sorts of things that involve phi as well. And we call that ratio of this golden number, phi, to one, the golden ratio. Now, what's so special about all of this? Remember how I said that the uh, Parthenon is a particularly attractive building? It just is. It looks right. Why? It's because it has this ratio in it. By the way, I, I realized that my computer here also has similar, a similar ratio. Yeah, it's, that's an attractive kind of rectangle. Start walking around. Start looking at buildings and things like that. You'll see some are really ugly. And then there are other buildings that are quite attractive. Just putting things like pillars in front of a building is not particularly attractive. But putting pillars in front of a building with beautiful dimensions to it, something like that golden rectangle, and the whole thing kind of works together in a very beautiful way. Anyway, these golden rectangles appears all over it. It's just all over the building. You see somebody sat down and was putting that in there, all over the place. Now, you've got to be careful with this sort of thing because there's something called confirmation bias. Have you ever met somebody who sees something in everything that they encounter? I remember encountering a very interesting guy, a very intelligent man, who was seeing Hebrew writing everywhere. Pictures from outer space, look at that, Hebrew writing. At first, I mean, he was absolutely, completely um, serious about it and um, you know, didn't, didn't seem to be completely insane or anything. But, you know, I was, I was kind of looking at these things thinking, well, that would be rather unusual if this picture of the earth from space happened to show some Hebrew writing and I'm certainly not seeing it. You know, um, am I the... Uh, Am I the uh, blind one, let's say? There was no Hebrew writing there. So we do have to be a little bit careful about overstating things sometimes. But when you look at that Parthenon, you do see that ratio showing up over and over and over again. Maybe the person who designed it just had much better taste than I have naturally. Or maybe, much more probably, they knew something about phi. And they realized that there was something pleasing to the eye about it. And so they were putting it in all over the place. Taking advantage of some geometry, if you want to call it that. Some math. This fabulous number, phi. It's, it's just everywhere. And once you start looking, you see it. We know that the Parthenon was designed by brilliant men. We know that it was made with men's hands. I'm a biologist. And I've already confessed to you that I love beautiful things. I have the unusual privilege of being married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Some of you might be too. <laughs> when I look at her face, 
Of course, I see a lot more than golden ratios. <laughs> However, in her face, there are golden ratios all over the place. She is the most beautiful woman in the world. It's amazing. If I did this with your faces, I would see something similar as well. Yes, there's variation there, but you know what? Human faces are beautiful and they happen to have a whole lot of golden ratios in them. You can decide whether that is by chance. You can decide whether evolution just somehow or other zeroed in on that. But we don't see evidence of that in nature. We don't see a fossil record that slowly, slowly, slowly zeroes in on golden ratios in things. By the way, there are golden ratios all over your body. The distance from your elbow to your wrist and from your wrist to the tip of your fingers is close to a golden ratio. One of my favorites some of these are inside us. Hopefully, no one's ever going to see them. But you know how your skull is knit together with these interesting kinds of joints that we call sutures? There happens to be a joint here. And then there's a joint that goes all the way across up here. And then there's a joint right here at the back. And if you have a beautiful Neanderthal kind of skull like mine. You have a lovely occipital lobe uh, um, uh, bun back here, so you can easily find it. It turns out that the ratio from here to here and from here to the back is a golden ratio. And it's not just in humans. You also see it in other organisms, other mammals. Kind of amazing. And probably at this particular point, I should make a confession to you. Yes, not only am I married to the most beautiful woman in the world, I have a girlfriend. And her name is Jill. And I think she's the most beautiful dog in the world. <laughs> what a gorgeous, gorgeous creature gift from God. She's just so full of love and perfection. When I watch her move, it's amazing. And every day I know that I'm going to come home and there is going to be an excited welcome. And it's not just because it's supper time. <laughs> I've been staying at home and writing the last few days. I never need to worry that I'll be alone. Jill is always there, right by my side. Sometimes she snores quite loudly, <laughs> but she's there. I know she's there. She is absolute perfection. Wherever we look, wherever we are in the world, there is this beauty that is reflected in this golden ratio. Golden ratios happen to be related to something called Fibonacci sequences. And just as I walked over here, you know, I wasn't just enjoying the sunshine, I happened to look down and I saw this pine cone. And it turns out that the way these scales pack together is described by a Fibonacci sequence. If, if you look down from the top, in fact, you can see all of these curves coming up here to the top. Um, you see the same thing in many different biological things. What you don't see is stuff gradually evolving towards it. There are fossil pine cones, and guess what? They exhibit exactly the same thing. 
Sometimes people point out that there are practical reasons why you would want to pack things together in that way. And yes, there are. But underneath everything, there is the mathematics. If you don't start with the mathematics, you are not going to end up with the beauty. Mathematics is something that is purely in your head. I did my PhD working on the most beautiful molecule in the world. And the great thing about this molecule is that it's found in every single living thing. It's called DNA. And there are many, many, many wonderful and beautiful things that we could talk about with DNA, but I just want to point out to you that one turn of that double helix happens to fit inside a golden rectangle. And when you look at DNA, there's something called the major groove and the minor groove. It turns out that the ratio of the major groove to the minor groove fits a golden ratio. That's one reason why when you look at DNA, it looks so cool. It's just a really, really cool shape. And it conforms to this fascinating, fascinating geometry. The reason for that is because that ratio of the width to the length of one twist of DNA happens to fall into what's called the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence approximates the golden ratio. And the further you go along the Fibonacci sequence, the closer the approximation is. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing and beautiful. And it's not the sort of thing that you slowly, slowly zero in on. It's either perfect from the start or Not at all. The mathematics, which is completely abstract, completely a product of minds, must be right first. And if it's not, no living thing exists because everything depends on DNA. There's another interesting thing about this business of filling in the golden rectangle with squares. If you start drawing curves in those squares, you get a very interesting kind of spiral. And you see it in lots of different places. One place that you see an approximation of it is actually in your cranium. This is like the beginning of a spiral, and if you go around like this and if you kept on going inside. So your skull itself approximates that shape. It's one of the reasons why going bald isn't so bad. (laughs) You let people see that beautiful curve. But you also see it in nature. And I love show and tell, so I brought a couple of examples here with me. Um, This is a fossil of a chambered nautilus. And if you look at it, it approximates that curve. Have you ever looked at one of these things and just sort of felt like, man, that's quite beautiful? That's a beautiful thing. If you have, it's probably not surprising to find, yeah, there's something in there about that golden ratio, golden rectangle, 
golden curve, whatever you want to call it. Now, here is a similar but different creature. And when you cut it open, you get that curve. This is called an ammonite. Not, not named after the Ammonites in the Bible, by the way. Named after the Egyptian god Amun, um, who had horns that curved around, kind of like this. Yeah, and so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Just a few months ago, I was walking along the uh, coast in, in England, the southern coast. There's an area there that they call the Jurassic Coast. And I came across this. These are some, some ammonites. You can see them actually in the, in the rock itself. So these haven't been, been removed from the rock. And I looked at these. They were everywhere. There were some nice, pretty large ones. And there were little tiny ones, you know, only probably about that big. And I thought to myself, there are people who believe that these rocks are on the order of 80, 100 million years old. And yet when we look at them, there is beauty. There's mathematics. And these are, this is data. This is stuff we can observe. We can take it in through our senses. It's kind of tragic, kind of tragic that all of this stuff is just there. We've got this record of death, and yet it's not just dead. It's beautiful as well. Other people have looked at this. In fact, in a year that you might have taken note of previously called 1844, there was a book that came out. And it kept pointing out all of this dead stuff out there in the fossil record. It pointed out all the ugly things in nature. And Alfred Lord Tennyson was struggling with something incredibly ugly. His friend had died. And over many years, he wrote a poem called In Memoriam, trying to figure out what had happened. In the writing of that poem, apparently he was influenced by that book. And he penned these words, he said, Who trusted God was love indeed, and love creation's final law, though nature, red in tooth and claw, with raven shrieked against his creed. This is the view that Darwinism brings to the world. Instead of looking and saying, no, look, these things, they're, they're beautiful, they're amazing, the tragedy is that they're dead, and asking, why? What's happening? What's the solution? Where's the hope? The answer that Darwinism gives, this delusion is, this is the way it's meant to be. This is how you came into existence. Billions of beautiful organisms dying, struggling, so that you could reach this pinnacle that you find yourself on. What's the attraction of it? If you believe it, you are master of your own fate. There is no God. There are no commandments you have to keep. 
There is no objective morality. Do what feels good. Be whatever you want. And yet, and yet, we come back to mathematics. This is Eugene Wigner writing. And uh, I should tell you, he's a Nobel Prize winner. He said these words, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend, for better or for worse, to our pleasure, even through perhaps also to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. You see, things don't have to be beautiful. They don't have to be mathematical. But when they are, they are beautiful. And when they're beautiful, they are mathematical. And the math comes first, then the beauty. The mind comes before the product with mathematics, because mathematics is the, 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 the foundation of everything. Bertrand Russell, great philosopher, wrote, mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty, a, a beauty cold and austere, like that of sculpture, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, yet sublimely pure and capable of a stern perfection such as only the greatest art can show. But you know what? I disagree with him. Yes, the beauty is there. The beauty is true. But the beauty shines through in the art. The beauty shines through in the creation. Not just physics or chemistry, biology. Biology is mathematical too. And it's beautiful. And that forms the foundation. And then we observe things. We have data. Logic and data, that's science. And together, in addition, we have art and beauty and emotion. When you see things lining up together, when they form a pattern, you know, there's, there's a joke among archaeologists, three stones in a row and you have a wall. When you see major patterns of data and they are lining up and all pointing towards the same thing, that thing, that truth that they are pointing towards is something that we can have reasonable confidence in. I'm going to end with a truth that was voiced by probably the greatest biologist other than God himself mentioned in the Bible, King Solomon, who was a biologist. Solomon wrote, he, this is God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. See, this is where it actually gets interesting for me. Not only has God made everything beautiful, He's put eternity in our hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. 
Remember how phi was an irrational number? You're never going to get to the end of it. The creation was made by an infinite God. When He comes again, when He does that new creation, when we go to heaven and we live with Him eternally, His creation is never going to stop giving us wonder and beauty and things to be amazed about. And that is a truth that we have to share with the world today that is in the grip of a profound delusion. Let's end with prayer. Dear Father, our Creator and Redeemer, I thank You for the beauty of Your creation. I thank You for giving us minds and senses to observe and comprehend the beauty, at least to some degree. I pray for that wisdom that only Your Holy Spirit can give as we struggle with end-time deceptions. Don't let us be deceived. Enlighten us with Your Spirit of truth and give us a love for what is true and beautiful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.